Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe toy review, and today I'll be taking a look at the G.I. Joe Heavy Articulated Vehicle Ordnance Carrier, the 1986 Havoc, and its driver, Cross Country. Now they both make their first appearance in the old Marvel comic run in issue 51, and both make their first appearance together in cartoon form in the 1986 five-part miniseries, Arise Serpenter Arise, in the very first part. Now, as you notice, the, um, the main body of the color is kind of a, a lightish green with orange bits on it. But in Europe, the main body was actually a bit deeper in color, and the orange bits were all red plastic. In 1990, the whole thing was chromed. It didn't come with a driver, unfortunately but it was part of the Sky Patrol series called the Sky Havoc. Now, the lines of the um, Havoc are rather odd, I'll admit, and it's fairly easy to pick this up on the aftermarket. It's actually fairly cheap. And a lot of people have actually requested that I pick this up. And I sort of um, looked at this thing and thought to myself, well, this is very, very odd looking. It has this big glass front here and the guy on top is kind of exposed. It looks rather, well, rather bad. However, once I got this thing in my hand, I realized that there is a method to this design madness. While the comics and cartoons show the Havoc being used as a frontline combat vehicle, I believe the Havoc is actually a fire support artillery vehicle. The front cab, where the drivers uh, lay down, it is very well exposed, but that actually gives them a lot of visibility. So, even it's very, very low to the ground, and the Havoc can actually roll right up straight towards cover. The gun portion not only um, pivots, but actually raises up, so it can fire over that cover. And all you have left is the rear of the vehicle, being exposed to any enemy fire, but as you can see, it has plenty of rear-facing armament. The Havoc comes with a lot of different features, including these uh, two front guns, which just swivels from side to side, but they swivel independently. The gun station at the back, as I said, pivots, as well as elevates. It actually ratchets, as you heard, on two, on two separate... Um, hinges so you can actually keep it in a wide range of uh, different poses here there is no peg on the uh, top seat here but it's actually kind of sunken in there so figures aren't likely just to fall off anytime soon you do have to sort of get this gun station out of the way in order to open the canopy uh, the canopy itself doesn't open up all the way but it doesn't really need to because the figures just kind of lie down in there. There's a depression at the back so that the feet can go in there. There are actually joysticks on the um, on the front here, but they're a little too close to the, uh, I guess, face monitors or whatever. So um, I wouldn't really try to put the hands on there. With the gun station out of the way, you can check out the removable engine cover and the massive engine that this thing runs on. The Havoc has turning treads. Both of them turn, and both of these are ratcheted as well. As a matter of fact, by both of them turning, you're actually giving this very, very long vehicle a very short turning span, which is kind of a nice touch and each of these kind of uh, cheese grater hubcaps can come off this is actually um, it's actually easier to take off these front ones than the back ones so if you're looking for one on the aftermarket the, the, the front um, hubcaps are often the things that are missing from these on the back we have the rearward facing armaments and 
we have four of these missiles, two on each side. And these actually have these um, sort of universal dumbbell pegs that a lot of G.I. Joe vehicles have. And you don't have to have them rear facing. You can just pop them in frontwards if you want or mix and match them. Also on the back are two guns with what looks like two barrels, but um, they're actually very close to each other, so you can't you can rotate them completely around if you want, but you can't completely do a 360 because they uh, sort of pop into each other. And this wouldn't be called a carrier if it didn't carry something. So you open this up and you have a recon craft in here. This hovering recon craft is actually very simple. Perhaps a little too simple for my tastes as it um, has this exposed engine, which looks like it should have a cover over it, but it doesn't. The, in, the um, machine guns on the side here, they don't do anything. They don't, they don't rotate or anything. On the bottom, we have these massive turbo fans, which is really actually kind of nice. As you can see, they move from side to side. That was to simulate how this thing would turn. I'm not really sure if it would turn or just bank or something like that. And of course you can put a figure right in, right in there. And one thing I didn't mention is that even with this, uh, even with a figure in it, you can put this thing right back in and actually cover the doors back in and the figure could actually stay right in there. Yeah, another reason why the uh, Havoc gets the carrier appellation. It has a total of eight foot pegs on the rear sills. Here I've just stuffed the, um, the missiles into the cavity right beside the engine cover just to give more room for the total of 12 figures that you can stuff onto the Havoc. Cross Country never came with any accessories, which is, again, one of the reasons why both the Havoc and him are very easy to find on the aftermarket and are not uh, particularly expensive. One thing I do have a bit of a problem with is the sculpt of his leg. It looks like his, his dark gray pant leg should actually go down beyond his knee. And this white portion is looks like it should just be a covering which only extends a little bit above this red band. It looks like a paint error, but they're all like this. Another thing is um, his elbow too. The gray part of his glove just seems to extend up into his elbow. And I, um, I mean, I suppose it looks like an elbow pad, but I don't think that that's supposed to be colored there at all. That looks like it should have been the flesh tone of his regular elbow. Of course, Cross Country is known to be a bit of a rebel, huh? pun intended, with his Civil War era kepi and his Confederate States belt buckle. He isn't the only one to have like these um, sort of Civil War era uh, little touches. As both uh, Wild Bill with his Union cap and Spirit, as I actually later learned, has a... Um, uh, Civil War era tracker uniform. And then there's um, Heavy Metal with his Confederate States belt buckle as well. Originally, Cross Country's file name was going to be Arlen W. Slaughter, something that you could still see in his page entry on G.I. Joe Order of Battle number one, where it was published in 1986, about the same time that the toy was released, so it probably was released at a time before the change occurred. Most likely, his last name is actually changed because of the inclusion of Sergeant Slaughter into the toy line. Another interesting thing is, if you read the text, it mentions that he is a driver for the Rhino, possibly a prototype name for the Havoc. 
Well, that's all the time I have right now. Thank you for watching my video, and stay tuned for next week to see another 1980s G.I. Joe toy review. See you then!